month, um, we get a newsletter from CCVT. We're part, part of uh, Churches of Christ Victoria, Tasmania, so we get a newsletter. And in this newsletter this month, it had um, an excerpt from a census that was done amongst all churches. And one of the things it talked about was what constitutes uh, a healthy church. And being a good church news, newsletter, they decided to use an narration, so they used the letter G. And they had three things about having a healthy church. Uh, one of them was generations. It's very important within a church to have generations, uh, to have people across a number of ages. Um, those churches that had no children under 18 uh, were ones where there seemed to be not a, a great future. Um, but, you know, we, we have, we have uh, a number of people under 18, so that's, that's a great thing in going in our, in our favour. The other G letter was growth. And growth is seen not just in the number of people who come to a church, but the number of people who lead and the number of people who get involved in, in volunteering. Um, and it talks about the number, the percentages. And it's interesting that sometimes the bigger the churches as you are, the, the bigger the number of people that, that do become involved. So if we start to see growth within our, within our church, we need to have more and more people become involved in volunteering um, and leading. So that's a really important G. And can you guess what the third G is? There's a lot of, actually, there's a lot of Gs, but this, this particular G they had in the newsletter was um, generous. And being generous is, it's an act that we have as a church, and it's a commitment that we make. Um, generous in your time, generous in your giving, which is another G, uh, another G word. And it talked about, um, of course, when it comes to newsletters, they start using percentages about this and that and the other thing, but... Um, a particular scripture that I wanted to share this morning was from Malachi, and it's one that we would have heard many times, Malachi chapter 3. Um, where's the, the quote is from, chapter ten, from verse 10. Bring a whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be enough room to store it all. There's an encouragement um, and a, a call for us as, as people of God to be generous in our, in our tithes and our offerings, but also in who, who we are. Um, there are many opportunities you can get involved in being part of a church, uh, serving on a team, being part of a setup, being part of a coffee, being part of a, um, a tech team. Um, being part of the welcoming and you can have the warm welcome that um, I was able to receive from people this morning uh, as I was, uh, Corey and I were outside. Um, it's great to be inside the house of the Lord this morning. Bless you, church. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, so now it is time, kids, to head out to Kids Church and we're going to hear from Jared, our Learning and Formation Catalyst, on the screens, I hear we're in for a treat. So tune in and enjoy. Friends, as we start our second week in our Flipping Tables series, I want to encourage you to stay in this attitude of prayer, uh, this attentiveness in worship um, of the one whose love is stronger than the struggles we are facing or maybe even the struggles that we're running from. Uh, as we start, I want to invite us to relax into the gentle silence of this moment right now to sit with Jesus, where we're talking about Jesus and him being around tables. We're going to be in Luke's gospel again. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either coming from or going to a meal. I mean, one could argue that um, even the nativity scene is a meal scene. Jesus is there in the manger. It's literally a feeding trough. And at the resurrection, our Lord is eating with people where they recognize and say, did not our heart burn within us? And in between that, this communion meal that we're invited to, we have these opportunities to reflect on Jesus' own ministry, how he opened up the table. And so let's relax into sitting with Jesus. Howard Thurman, before he would preach, would sometimes allow his congregation to settle for 10 minutes in silence. I want you to relax. I'm not about to do that to you, but I do want to encourage you to take this moment to prepare your heart to meet 
Jesus. In a posture of prayer, I want to invite you to gently close your eyes. As you breathe into this moment, as you become aware of your body and the gift of your body and the promise of the redemption of our bodies, can you sense Jesus? Can you sense him in all his kindness? Can you sense him waiting for you? Notice the corners of his mouth, the empathy in his eyes, his genuine joy at you being aware of him and you waking and wanting to spend this time with him. If I could borrow a phrase from America's black church tradition in your sanctified imagination, can you hear Jesus asking you, what is keeping you from relaxing in my love in this moment? What is keeping you from relaxing in my love in this moment? Before we open the gospel, in the quietness of this now, can you name in your heart what's keeping you from relaxing into God's love right now? Finally, can you see Jesus extending his nail-scarred hands, maybe even with a wry smile, asking from you that which keeps you from him? Friends, can you give it to him in this moment, whether it be grief or pain or shame or anxiety? Can you trust that to him that our hands might be open to receive what he has for us? In this now of quiet communion, as we allow this time to prepare our hearts for the communion with Christ together, can you imagine an exchange? What holds you back from the love that God is and that God has for you and that God longs to move through you, that you might return to that ancient beauty that you were made for? Let's take this moment of quiet to sit with Jesus. And I'll allow you to go and undergo that great exchange. Precious Lord, you've given me that sacred task to speak in such a way that does not break the silence in which you speak and speak your word, the word, your son, Jesus, who breaks all silence that keeps us from hearing your name and keeps the voice of those who are hurting from having their voice uh, so we ask in this moment, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for truly you are our rock and our redeemer. Anoint me now with the spirit that you poured out over Christ, that I might be free to get out of the way that your love might move through me in such ways that people experience the liberation, which is your kingdom, your reign, your coming presence into this moment, that we might be free to dance again in the purpose of our very lives. We pray this in the mighty and magnificent name of our nonviolent Messiah, Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Friends, in this spirit of prayer, as we open up this text, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I first preached at the age of 15, um, uh, invited by the community that formed me, that baptised me, uh, to call us round the table 
And uh, at the age of 42, I'm still doing that. Now I've done that on Sundays where I've preached at four services and that, that's a lot. I've done that on Sundays where I've preached at three different churches. I've done it on Sundays where I've preached to 15 people. I've done it on Sundays where I've preached to over 15,000 people. But I've never done what I feel God is asking me to do now. Friends, this Sunday, I'm going to preach the same text I preached last Sunday to the same congregation. The text that we were previously in, in terms of Luke 14, we're going to spend again in this text. So if you have your Bibles, I ask that you open up to Luke 14 and uh, we'll read from verse 1 to verse 14. And the simple reason why I'm going to do this is because I feel what God is asking me to do. Uh, This text won't let me go. I don't think it will let us go. And so my encouragement is let's wrestle with it like Jacob until it blesses us, Uh, blesses us in such ways that like Jacob, We walk differently, maybe with a limp, but walking differently. Uh, So the rest of our life is actually shaped by this wrestle. So if you have your text, please open up to Luke 14. But I'm going to ask if you would read from the perspective of uh, Sayers with a strange swelling. Now, Sayers with a strange swelling is clearly not the name of the person in the text, nor is it Davo with dropsy. Um, these are Australian nicknames that might familiarise the character to us, those who are Australian. Or maybe you simply want to put your own name. But what I want you to do as we read this text this week is as you hear about the person suffering with dropsy at the beginning of this text, I want you to enter in as if that was you. I want you to enter in in such ways that you pay attention to why did Jesus send you away? I think this is critical for this text. Jesus Jesus does not allow this person, you, me, to actually stay in this toxic setting, but actually sends us away. And I want us to spend time with that first question. Why does Jesus send us away? Secondly, What place did Jesus sit in? For those who were with us last week, uh, we've heard talk of Jesus discussing where people sit. I want you to imagine where Jesus is sitting in this situation. And finally, three, what does it mean that Jesus invites us to sit with him? That's the whole sermon. Those three queries, those questions, those Uh, invitations to to wonder and allow the text to pass over us in such ways that we undergo it. Why did Jesus send you away? What place does Jesus sit in? And what does it mean for us to be invited to sit with Jesus? So friends, let's open up the text together. Luke chapter 14, verse 1. On the Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of the prominent Pharisee, For those who are with us last week, a simple reminder that if we scapegoat the Pharisees, we undo what Jesus is trying to undo in us and our communities. Um, The Pharisees, there is so much to admire. In fact, just a few verses prior to this, if we're in the previous chapter, the Pharisees have warned Jesus that Herod is out to get him and will kill him. Jesus calls Herod a fox. That's not a compliment. And then Jesus describes himself as a hen. Uh, For those who have kept uh, chickens will know that foxes often go after chickens. And yet Jesus not only describes himself in such way, but describes himself as a mother chicken who wishes that she could gather her chicks under her, protect them, even though those who have been put in power as puppet kings of the Roman Empire are going to attack Jesus. Jesus pleads, grieves, and weeps over Jerusalem if they only would know what would made for peace And if we were preaching a different sermon, we might go into the fact that Jesus uses these feminine imagery continually when he's describing his own vocation. Um, Sophia is known by what she does. Lady Wisdom is known by what she does. This is how Jesus describes himself. Other people was like son of David, um, uh, rabbi, but Jesus describes himself in these ways. But that's not the sermon today. I just want us to pay attention that the Pharisees are a revival movement where people who are oppressed are finding their dignity by setting themselves up over and against those whom they could easily be in the situation of. See, in the verses just prior to what we're reading right now, 
There is talk of Jerusalem, Jerusalem being the centre of the temple, and how Pharisees see the temple as corrupt. It's controlled by the Sadducees and the Herodians, those who have been put in power by the Roman Empire. They don't want to collaborate and collude with those who are stripping them of their dignity. So the Pharisees have said every table in every home is going to be our temple. And this is like dignity giving agency comes out of this. And so here we're in the setting of this revival meeting of a Judaism where people can actually find their dignity and not collude with Roman occupation. The thing is, though, that when you start to put yourself in the place of priests, it is often easy to forget that what the Torah teaches is that the priest is to give a sacrifice on God's behalf to the people, while we so easily paganize it when our imagination is occupied by foreign powers, and we paganize it in ways that the priests give an offering from the people to an angry deity or deities. But the other problem with that is that temples themselves are a place where things are killed. The religious term for that is sacrifice. And I want us to pay attention as we're in verse one again. Where is the potential sacrifice? Who is potentially sacrifice? And those three questions. Why did Jesus send you away? What place does Jesus sit in? And what does it mean for us to sit with Jesus? He was being carefully watched. Verse two. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. There's Davo with dropsy, or maybe it says with a strange swelling, but you, but me. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Pay attention. Torah's intention is for healing, and Jesus is reminding all of us. But they all remain silent. So taking hold of us, he healed you, he healed me, and he sent us on our way. As the door closed behind us and the sun has set and the moon is bouncing off those stones as we walk by, we walk by the first window and we look in and we realise Jesus is still going. But maybe we'll, you linger by the next window to hear what's going on. Then you hear Jesus ask, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls in a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? Again, they say nothing. You notice Jesus noticing people fighting for places of honour at the table. And as this politicking of place and space starts to play out as you peer through this window, you hear Jesus say this, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour. For a person more distinguished than you may have both of you who will come and say, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that your host, they will come to you and say, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all your fellow guests. For anyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then you looking through the window again, as this silence kind of settles and the awkwardness gets turned up to 11, you notice Jesus catch the eye of the host and looking in, in the eye, you hear Jesus say, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your sisters, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing of God's word. Friends, um, some of you know me well enough to know that I love film. I actually studied um, film uh, as part of studying fine arts. Um, 
And those who know me might be thinking, um, is Jared going to draw on Russian film? Is he going to draw on um, Andre Lubrev's um, uh, and, and that masterpiece? Um, or maybe some more modern Russian film like Leviathan, for those who have seen that incredible depiction of the corruption of state and church, uh, almost as a, a parabolic telling of the story of Job in today's setting. Or maybe Jared's going to jump over to Japan, spend some time with Mirazaki and the incredible animator and his sensitivity to ecology, particularly trees, the, the spaciousness and the silence that allows an animation to be both gentle and funny and moving, uh, as opposed to the, the pop and the zip of so much stuff that comes out of the US. But no, we're not going to talk How's Moving Castle, nor are we going to talk about Spirited Away, but maybe we could go to the US and we could spend time with, um, you know, one of Ava's great creations like Selma. Or um, last week I talked about Spike Lee's joint, uh, Malcolm X, one of my favourite movies that some of you watched as homework because I think The Nation of Islam is a very helpful um, uh, parabolic comparison to the Pharisees and what it is for a people to find an identity over and against when a people have found themselves on the underside of a system of supremacy, whether it be Roman supremacy or white supremacy. And yet, while appreciating and being able to identify those same dynamics in our own community, know that Jesus's way is an alternative to that way in that it's not us versus them or us over and against them, but there is just us and this strange opening up of a different possibility. But instead, I'm going to go to a film, another film from America that people might not expect. Um, Emmanuel's going to kindly play that for us now. Well, I guess that's it. It's OK, everybody, back on the bus. Aww. Hey, what's with Ernie? I don't know. I'll be right back. <laughs> hey, Ernie. What's up? Nothing. You falling in love with the wall or something? I had an accident. You had an accident? What does that mean? You! Oh, I know. OK. Uh, don't worry, buddy. You hang tight. I'll be right back. Hey, look, everybody. Billy peed his pants. Of course I peed my pants. Everybody my age pees their pants. It's the coolest. Really? Yes! You ain't cool unless you pee your pants. Wow. Hey, man, Ernie pees pants, too. Oh. All right. If peeing your pants is cool, consider me Miles Davis. Oh, that was the grossest thing I've ever heard in my life. Let's go. There's your introduction to this brilliant cinematic masterpiece, this reflection on the gospel's power. Um, uh, it's a theological reflection on Gerardian anthropology right there. Uh, that might not immediately be what comes to mind, but I think uh, the incredible gift of this scene um, is that it actually opens up something of why Jesus might have sent us away. Uh, some of us have the kind of histories where even already we've couched this imaginatively, um, the trauma as we were paying attention to our body of what it is to be in religious settings that um, our reality means that while there might not be sacrifices happening physically in front, that our lives are sacrificed to give people an identity over and against us. Underneath many of our tables, this is not scapegoating of the Pharisees. This is actually naming that we share the same scapegoating dynamics that happened in this Pharisee's house. That underneath the tables we eat round are the bodies of those whom, for whatever reasons, people deem that we will be glued together if we can get them and not us. So much like little Ernie in this situation, the danger for Ernie in this situation 
is that the rest of the kids turn on Ernie. And the kids turn on Ernie not because they're evil, not because, like, they're inherently out to get others, but the subtlety or banality of evil, as Hannah Arendt would call it, is that our own anxiety about being in Ernie's position starts to express itself that if we don't differentiate ourselves from Ernie, we're going to be associated with Ernie and Ernie's shame. What communities do with their shame, what we do when we wet our pants or we sneak into um, a house for a Sabbath meal because our fellow Jews can't turn us away and then everybody starts to notice that says with the strange selling, uh, swelling or Davo with dropsy or you and me are different in such a way that everybody else will either have to be associated with it or disassociate with it. And the trauma of that for us is so real that some of us are experiencing that now. My encouragement to you in that is, can you go back to the space where Jesus wants to exchange that which we feel keeps us from him? He wants to take on and give to us everything that God invites us into that we're made for. St. Gregory of Nyssa says that which is not assumed cannot be saved. Jesus steps into our whole situation, takes it upon himself that we might take upon ourselves everything that God has and God is in terms of God being love and that love saving. Friends, what this has got to do with Ernie is the same reason why Jesus sends us out. Sometimes we're in certain settings, certain religious settings, where for us to stay is dangerous and Jesus' word for us, and maybe you need to hear this today, is simply run. Don't allow yourself to be another sacrifice on their religious system that sets them up over and against others. If this isn't a safe space for you, Jesus has a word for us. He heals us and then he says before he takes on all that was aimed at us and takes it on himself, he says, go. Now, there might be a call at a different stage in our journey on a different day where we're healed to such an extent that we too might come back and find where Jesus is sitting and sit with him. But let's start with the word that Jesus is speaking to us right now. And sometimes that word is, I've got this, I've got you, but you're not safe here. Go. That's a word for some of us right now. But as we go like Ernie, we notice that if we have a friend in Billy, and friends, what a friend we have in Billy, um, the, this other kind-hearted um, uh, Jewish teacher in this situation who is of the classroom but not like the classroom. It might simply be the age differentiation, but there's something about this student which means that he can take on the shame of this child in such a way that the whole class does not turn on er Ernie. But instead, Jesus steps into that situation, shows everything that was Ernie's, but now it's no longer toxic. Something about Jesus wearing our situation means that Ernie can turn around, face the situation, and it hasn't been removed in the sense of some of our worship songs. Um, this is amazing love. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Um, that Jesus would, you know it better than I do, um, take my place, um, uh, uh, that he would take my cross, that I would be set free. And we're like, how did we get there? How did we get from Jesus taking my place to Jesus taking my cross? Instead of what's happening in Luke 14, where Jesus takes our place so we can take up our cross. Friends, some of us earlier in the week spent time with our brother in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, United States of America, uh, Terence Hawkins. And Terence talked about his experience of watching his grandfather on the wooden floors of his African Methodist Episcopal uh, Church of Zion and watching the prayer meeting that happened prior to worship mm -hmm. and watching his grandfather beat his foot on those wooden floors in the front you and singing a very different tune, a song that some of us may know and comes to mind, and I'll spare you me singing it to you, but the lyrics go, did Jesus bear the cross alone? 
that all the world go free. No, there is a cross for everyone. And there is a cross for me. Now, the spirituality of Jesus going to the cross to set us free and free to take up our cross versus the spirituality of Jesus going to the cross, taking my cross so I can go get richer or um, move out some like cosmic tower of celebrity and influence uh, to be a mighty woman or man of God versus what it is to be found with Jesus amongst those who are hurting, amongst those who would otherwise be scapegoated, amongst those who have got their back against the wall as Thurman would say, or like Ernie had their front against the wall because they're shame. They can't step out in front of others in a situation because there is their shame. And Jesus, like Billy, steps into that moment with a kind of creativity, takes it on himself in such a way and says, if we need to, you go. But he takes on that. See, friends, there is an angry deity revealed in the scriptures. And some of you are like, yes, the God of the Old Testament. No, Lord forbid. That kind of anti-Semitism has no place in the church. I mean, it's subtle anti-Semitism. But how is it that our Jewish friends know their Torah well enough to know that more often than not, God is summarized by saying God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love that God sounds like good news. And you're like, but Jared, you said anger. Yeah, what is it to worship a God who takes injustice, oppression, alienation, and exploitation so seriously that that which harms the dignity of all is something that breaks the heart of God, that God feels it and is angry about it. But the slow to anger bit means that God is not wrathful in a sense of like just letting it all out willy nilly, but instead will woo us with strings of loving kindness, inviting us back to the reality that we can meet round tables where sacrifices need not be made because Jesus has taken that place. So we no longer have to be, keep putting each other in it. Friends, there are bodies underneath our tables. There are people hiding. Some of them have made a like beeline to the door because we've listened to Jesus say we don't have to be in these situations, but some of us have already been sacrificed and we're the black sheep in our family or we're that family on our street or we're that side of town or we're that city in our nation or we're that country and suddenly we're in that situation where it's us and them, the sinners over there, the righteous over here, and we can't hear St. Paul, that apostle, himself, formed in um, the beauty and the best of the pharisaical tradition of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, yet he considers all that which was used to set himself over against others rubbish. Go learn your Greek. Look at the word that he actually uses, skubalon. It's why Martin Luther, in his 16th century translation of the vernacular into the German, translates it, I consider it all Scheisen. He is closer to what the Greek is saying. And if you don't speak in the tongue of German, ask for the gift of interpretation or uh, address your questions to Pastor Corey. I'm leaving that one alone. What I'm saying is why Paul can see all that so clearly. And then in the book of Romans say, no, sinners aren't that group of people. The people who are ruining your purity revival project, your project of we all get to be priests, every home gets to be the kind of purity and we're going to set ourselves over and up against others. And Paul knows that system. He was ahead of that system. And he had this spiritual experience where he realized that in his zeal to take out that on them so we can be in us. He, he had the experience on the Damascus road that that them is actually Jesus. Friends, whoever we go after is Christ. He's hungry, he's naked, he's imprisoned, he's sick, he's needing a meal. And we're like, when did we see you? When were you hungry? When were you? That was him. We did it to him. And those bodies that are hiding underneath the tables of places where we set up us versus them spiritualities. Friends, can we hear Paul say, no, 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 I, I want to know Christ. I want to know the one who steps in my place, takes my shame. There is an angry deity that's revealed through scriptures 
it's not the God of the Old Testament, quote unquote, because the God of, God of the Old Testament is revealed in Christ Jesus. That's, that's why any of us have got any permission to mess around with those sacred texts as we've been grafted in to those people through the grace of Jesus. So how dare we be ungracious with their beautiful texts and not read them in ways that don't produce in us what they produce in Jesus, which is the kind of beauty which reveals who God really is. But friends, there is an angry deity revealed in scripture. Why is it that our Jewish neighbors can live lives of humility that pursue justice for the common good And yet Christians say, your God is a God of vengeance, while them trying to convert them by saying, and if you don't accept Jesus as an offering for your sins, which of course Jesus is the offering for our sins, but let's go all the way back to the beginning. The priest offers on behalf of God to the people. You listen to a lot of Christians evangelize and they're saying, we offer to God the only good bloke there actually was and God takes it out on him so he doesn't take it out on you. Friends, that's not forgiveness. If you need to make somebody bleed before you can forgive, that's not forgiveness. That's vengeance. That's like serious anger issues. And if we take seriously that Jesus says to us, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That means that that telling of what's happening at the cross isn't worthy of Jesus. If we take seriously in Colossians that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, he is the image of the invisible God. Who's he? Friends, it's Sunday. It's church. The answer is probably going to be Jesus. Jesus in in Hebrews one, where it's like, um, he is a very representation of the glory of God. Or in John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Who is he? Friends, it's Jesus. It's not that there isn't an angry deity revealed in scripture. It's just revealed to be us, a false deity, a blasphemous, idolatrous mob who needs blood to set ourselves over and against others. Why did Jesus send us away? because he doesn't want us to be anywhere near the kind of spiritualities that need other people to bleed. Jesus brings an end to the us versus them. What place does Jesus sit in? Friends, as we land this, this is the question. Jesus was teaching about like, uh, if you're throwing a a banquet, uh, where are people going to sit? If it's a wedding, where are people going to sit? We miss if we don't realize that we're not offering Jesus to God, so God won't get us. Friends, it's that Bible verse that people hold up at the football game, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And we hear the so when we think it's about how much instead of about how. So let me say it again in another way. God like this loved the world, that God gave of God's self in the Son. Did you see it? I wish I could preach this as much as I'm feeling it. Friends, Jesus takes it upon himself so we don't have to face the wall of shame, but we can face the angry mob. And instead of attacking us, we can actually be in that place and know who we are and stand and go, I know I'm a sinner. And the shame of that is taken away where it becomes a joy to receive all the things where I know that I try and meet those needs in ways that actually break myself and others. And I can see that now and I can see a more beautiful way, a better way, the way that Jesus reveals the way of the cross. And so the final question, what does it mean for us to sit with Jesus? It doesn't mean that we harbor secret vengeful thoughts that the first will be last and the last will be first will actually one day mean that like, I'm going to finally get my way on those bullies. They're going to get it because Jesus is going to bring a day where the things are going to be turned upside down and then I will get to bully the bullies. My friends, just as the gospel of Luke starts as Jesus in a trough and ends around a table where we realize that our hearts were burning within us, we can start to hear as John, Jesus' cousin, say that the mountains will be brought low and the valleys will be lifted up and the glory of the Lord will be revealed because the shame that Jesus takes on when Jesus takes our place means that no one is going to be over and against others. We're going to be all in this together and it starts right now. It starts at this 
table that we're invited to right now. It is the table of the Lord. It's the table where our shame is taken away. We can look at the reality of the things that we do that keep us from our, our true self and from others. And we can receive the grace that Jesus takes our shame and gives us joy for our ashes. Friends, a garment of praise for our spirit of despair. Can you hear how he takes it all on himself? What a friend we have in Billy and what a friend we have in Jesus. All our grief and joy and sorrow and shame and the way of the cross is not thank you that you took my place so I don't have to take up my cross. No, it's what Paul knows because his story is when I was persecuting them, I saw, I had a revelation. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he can now pray, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And we go, glory, yes, resurrection. And the fellowship of what? Sharing in his sufferings? Yeah, yeah, because what it is for Jesus to take my place and to detoxify my shame is that I can go back to the very place which is a place of accusation and I can trade that in for a place of affirmation. You can trade in what they... Friends, as we start our second week in our... trough and ends around a table where we realize that our hearts were burning within us, we can start to hear, as John, Jesus' cousin, say that the mountains will be brought low and the valleys will be lifted up and the glory of the Lord will be revealed because the shame that Jesus takes on when Jesus takes our place means that no one is going to be over and against others. We're going to be all in this together and it starts right now. It starts at this table that we're invited to right now. It is the table of the Lord. It's the table where our shame is taken away. We can look at the reality of the things that we do that keep us from our, our true self and from others. And we can receive the grace that Jesus takes our shame and gives us joy for our ashes. Friends, a garment of praise for our spirit of despair. Can you hear how he takes it all on himself? What a friend we have in Billy and what a friend we have in Jesus. All our grief and joy and sorrow and shame. And the way of the cross is not thank you that you took my place so I don't have to take up my cross. No, it's what Paul knows because his story is when I was persecuting them, I saw, I had a revelation. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he can now pray, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And we go, glory. Yes, resurrection. And the fellowship of what? Sharing in his sufferings? Yeah, yeah, because what it is for Jesus to take my place and to detoxify my shame is that I can go back to the very place which is a place of accusation and I can trade that in for a place of affirmation. We can trade in what they said against us for what God says to us. And the very thing that the enemy would use against us, God now uses a part of our testimony to actually bring us to the place of who we truly are. There is an angry deity that demands blood and don't feed it. It's the devil. The Gospel of Luke says that the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. John's first epistle says the Son of God came to destroy the work of the devil. Friends, in this text, we see how Jesus destroys the work of the devil. He comes eating and drinking in such ways where everybody's invited. Our shame is taken and he exchanges it for what we're made for. We're made in the image of God to grow in the likeness of God. And the love that saves us is the love that will go on as we let that love in and we 
grow into the image of that love. God has taken on our full humanity that we might share in God's full divinity. That doesn't make you a fourth member of the Holy Trinity. It just means that your life can live in that love eternally. Friends, this is the gospel. Jesus sits in the place where no one wants to sit in. And the good news is we can love him enough that we want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that somehow we might attain resurrection from the dead. Where is resurrection found? Go to the cross. Go to the cross of Jesus and find that it is God giving of God's self to us today, right now, so that we don't have to take from each other. No more bodies under tables. No more black sheep left out. No more it's the gays or it's the Muslims or it, it, it's uh, those people or those the refugees. We have seen this past week, friends, this strange distorted reality where the tragedy of millionaires seeking adventure versus refugees seeking safety. And our world's attention and identification is with those in the positions of privilege, not the people in the positions without power. And the incarnation from the manger to the resurrection is God comes all the way down that we might be emptied of the shame and join Christ where Christ is. Friends, I've got to get out of here. I've, I've talked for way too long. But this is a message that won't let me go. This is the gospel that I know it. God made him who was without sin to be sin, that we might share in who God really is. Let us go to the places that we fear in ourself and in our streets and in our neighbourhoods and in our cities and in our countries and in the world that we've been told not there, no good news there, because that is where we'll find Christ, not merely in solidarity, but with the keys of liberation to lock us out of the places of shame, that we can stand with those and pray with the Apostle Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sitting there with him in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that I somehow might attain resurrection from the dead. Friends, would you pray with me? Precious Lord, I wish I could preach this like I feel this. So I'm going to ask that you take all that I've shared and open it up in such ways that people would experience it not in their heads but in their very bodies that you long to redeem, that there would be healing breaking in for people. And that gift might be the gift of tears. That gift might be the gift of, like, removing shame, a, a loosening of people's guts or, or necks, an opening of people's hands. But would you prepare us for the table where there's no way to disqualify ourselves if we welcome others? Would you prepare us for that table where you invite us with your nail-scarred hands to leave judgment behind and recognise your mercy, to leave indifference behind and recognise our family, to leave scapegoating and us and them games behind to see Christ and him crucified as the resurrected Lord. Lord, like the Apostle Paul goes on to say, not that we've already attained this, but we press on to take hold of that which you took hold of us for. Take hold of us now, we pray in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. My friends, as we... Amen. What a beautiful table of communion we're being invited to this morning. So I'm just going to invite the host team to come up and uh, bring the emblems. So there will be a basket of crackers spread and a cup of juice. You can just take one of those crackers and dip it in the juice and receive a blessing as the team speak over you. So I'm going to just invite you to the table, the shame eradicating beautiful table of Jesus. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love and for those who want to love God more. So come, 
you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have come for the first time, you who have tried to follow Jesus, you who have failed to follow Jesus, and you who have just decided to follow Jesus, come. Let nothing keep you from love's feast. Let no one empty this table of love's power. Leave judgment behind and receive mercy. Leave indifference behind and recognize God's family. Leave now if necessary and go be a forgiver and then run back because it is the Lord who invites you and it's God's will that those who desire healing and hunger and thirst for God's justice should encounter the Holy Spirit here. So come. And if you haven't as yet, please feel free to go and invite your children to the table of communion. But just come when you're ready to receive. team. So that concludes the uh, end of our service. It's been a beautiful morning. Um, I have been so encouraged to be reminded just the magnificence and wonder of who Jesus is. It'll be beautiful to be able to carry that into the week this week. Uh, so I would love to just leave you with a benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, next week we kick off NIDOC week. NADOC, NADOC, NIDOC, I'm never sure how to say it. Um, but Sunil will be on the mic kicking us off, which will be great. Um, and I would love to leave you with a question to ponder with each other um, over coffee, which will be available. What are you giving praise for to God this week? So just, I guess, let's have moments of encouragement with each other where we can celebrate what God's doing in our lives, the small, the big, um, and go and enjoy conversation and have a wonderful week. And I hope you stay dry on the way out. See ya.